Hello and a very warm welcome to the DGRP morning briefing on geopolitical challenges. My name is Guntram Wolfen. I'm the director of DGRP, the German Council on Foreign Relations. And today we want to focus on the transatlantic response to Russia's war on Ukraine and its impact on US-China relations. So a pretty big topic, I would say. Um, but it's big um, because we have really a stellar lineup of speakers that I'm sure will fill this topic uh, uh, really well. And uh, let me welcome our speakers that are today here with us at our offices, uh, at our event space at, at DGAP. Um, let me welcome Angela Stand. She's a senior advisor and director emerita at Georgetown University and a fellow senior fellow at Brookings, and uh, Dan Hamilton, senior fellow at the Size Foreign Policy Institute, um, and also at Brookings. And last but not least, of course, let me uh, welcome um, uh, uh, Stefan Meister, the head of our International Order and Democracy program, who I think is well known to all of our listeners. Anyway, Thank you so much for uh, joining us online. So this is a hybrid um, briefing, uh, meaning um, uh, we can actually see you on the screen, um, but you can also see, we can interact in person actually here on scene, which is actually quite a nice experience to see each other in, in person and discuss in person. Um, but still, we do want to hear, of course, from you, our audience um, on the screen. And so, so please do um, do raise your hands after the first half hour so that we can take your questions or just uh, just send us uh, questions on the chat. I have a iPad here so that I can see your questions and I will read them to our panelists. So. Um, Thanks so much for for being here, and let me let me give the floor to you, uh, Dan, uh, to kick us off. No, it's working. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, good morning, uh, Guntram. Thank you so much, uh, and Stefan, for hosting us here today. We're delighted to be here. It's great to be back in in Berlin. Um, so we, we unfortunately have a fairly sobering uh, topic here. Uh, and just to kick it off, at least in my view, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin has invaded Europe uh, and uh, not just Ukraine. Uh, and that the challenge here is that the European security order that from which we all benefit is being defended at the moment by a non-NATO country uh, that we are really uh, under duty to support. Um, and that that European security, uh, we we're gonna have to protect against Russia. So many of the old slogans, I think are uh, passe, let's put it that way. And that Ukraine is emblematic of a much bigger set of changes that we have, mean we have left this post-Cold War uh, era. It's what I call an age of disruption now. It's not only great power, competition, but a whole host of other type of disruptive challenges that we're facing. So, and Ukraine is sort of ground zero of that. And that's why it's not just about Europe. It's about really the, the future of how we are interacting as societies and nations. Um, so I'm always struck, because uh, Angela and I always have to go on these TV shows and everything. There's always somebody who asks the question, how will this end? People like to ask that question. <clears throat> I don't think it's the right question. Uh, I think there are two other questions that are more relevant to us. One is, how will this continue? Uh, I don't see a, a, a clear end. I don't see certainly a negotiated end anytime soon. In fact, what I see is continuation of this conflict in which neither side is going to reconcile anytime soon and most both sides are probably likely wanting to keep pressing ahead which will open up a whole range of other potential escalatory um, possibilities and realities you see yesterday martial law declared uh not only in the annex territories but in parts of you know russia itself 
uh, which allows Putin to suppress his own population. Um, part of those orders uh, in the annexed territories will have Ukrainians mobilized to kill other Ukrainians. Uh, it's, a, it's a dreadful, dreadful situation. And that's just one of the kinds of tools that Putin is using to escalate. The nuclear bluff is there. I hope it's a bluff. Uh, but he has a whole range of other things that he's doing. You can see now the next front in the war is to, to try to destroy Ukrainians' uh, power infrastructure, uh, targeting the critical infrastructures of a society as a, as a military tactic uh, is certainly something now Russia is uh, doing. Um, and we should just anticipate further disruptions, provocations, as far as the eye can see. So I don't believe it's going to end soon. I think we should focus more on how it will continue and to be prepared for those range of possibilities. I think the second question in my mind is, how far will this extend? Ukraine is ground zero, but this is not just about Ukraine. And it's certainly not just about the land in Ukraine. Uh, the Black Sea is fully involved in this. We have three NATO allies on the Black Sea. We have a whole host of other countries there. Turkey plays a particularly important role in that regard. Um, the EU has uh, the Eastern Partnership that it developed years ago, six countries. Russian troops are in all of them now. So I think the EU has some rethinking to do about what the purpose of that was and, and what it even means anymore. The old concepts just aren't holding out. Uh, you see Belarus again being dragged into this. Uh, the drone attacks now with Iran, it's extending now, bringing Iran into this picture very clearly, uh, launched from Belarus. Uh, I mean, this is now expanding You know, the remit once again of how we have to think about this. And if you extend it further into Eurasia, you see Russia so focused on Ukraine that other things are happening throughout the Eurasian space that are, again, part of turbulence, conflict, unsettled issues. And I believe those will continue also as far as I can see. We have to be prepared. The further east you go in Europe, the more turbulent, unsettled, sporadically violent it will be. That is Europe today. Uh, and the Western half of Europe is not going to remain stable if it's not able to uh, address these issues coming from its Eastern half. Um, so a uh, couple other points. I think Putin has united the West. I think the West is, uh, Western strategy now is very united despite quibbles on this or that, but it's, but I think the other reality is Putin has enhanced Europe's strategic dependence on the United States. <clears throat> So ideas of autonomy at the moment seem to be otherworldly at a time when uh, Europe really is depending on the U.S. to carry the, the weight for much of the support for Ukraine, uh, which is causing some domestic ripples back uh, in the United States. I think another implication of the war, which I'm just going to defer to Angela to, is that the North Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific are becoming strategically linked. It's not a half a world away. It is what's happening there is directly related to what's happening here and vice versa. And we have to understand the connections if we're gonna really have a strategy, but I'll defer to Angela on that one. Um, and final point is these disruptive threats to, uh, to the flows that connect our societies is becoming a premier security challenge on the order of you know, traditional territorial security. Uh, states, non-state actors are instrumentalizing, weaponizing all of these flows. Uh, it's not just sabotage, you know, incidents in the Black in the Baltic Sea. It's everything. It's weaponizing people. If the power infrastructure in Ukraine is destroyed, you could you can expect another onslaught of millions, millions of Ukrainian refugees coming here in the next few months. Uh, you think about energy, which of course we know is being instrumentalized, food, uh, goods and services, the cyber world, every flow is now susceptible to disruption. And so we have to build an operational strategy to be resilient to these flows. 
And it's not just about Russia, as I, you know, I, I have a strong quote from The Economist the day after the September 11th attacks, long ago on New York City, in which they said, you know, those attacks were not an attack. Uh, it was an attack not only on freedom, but it was an attack through freedom. It was using the very arteries and flows of open societies against those societies. And that's what you're saying. And I believe Putin believes he can sustain this type of conflict and outlast the West because in the end, our societies will cave in, not be able to keep up. And I think that's a key question for us. Can we sustain on our side uh, this conflict? So what do we do? The NATO uh, Madrid decisions were quite important last June. Essentially means NATO is committed to move to a new type of security uh, posture in the eastern part of the alliance from what are now tripwire, small tripwire forces that could be overrun. And then the idea was to reinforce. And this Estonian prime minister said, that means you wipe out our country. That strategy doesn't work too well now. Uh, to a new posture of what's called deterrence by denial. That's what ally leaders mean when they say we'll defend every inch. That means you have to deny any attempt to cross that border, not. And that means very strong forward positioning uh, and across all domains, you know, land, sea, air, cyber, you mention it. That's an ambitious goal that'll take a decade. Uh, and Germany's on the front line of that as one of the leading uh, countries, framework countries there. And that's going to require huge lift, especially, uh, I would say, from Germany. Uh, I think we have to then think harder about if there's no consensus for Ukraine and NATO, uh, do everything we can to support Ukraine's ability to defend itself, not only in conventional terms, but also in this terms of resilience that I talked about because they're on the front line of that battle too. And so uh, what some of us have talked about is what we call a secure neighborhood initiative that all of the countries there, also Moldova, Georgia, the other ones should receive as much assistance as they can from us to be able to defend themselves absent an article five guarantee, which isn't gonna come soon. So that would be something we have to work on. And then finally, again, making the transatlantic link clearer. Um, the US is stretched. We are dealing with contingencies in the Indo-Pacific and the North Atlantic. And in the event of simultaneous crises, the United States might simply not be there in the way that Europeans expect. That's not in any of our interests. So we have to also use this decade to build a new balance in which uh, Europeans should do two things. One is be able to have the strategic capability to, to, with half, half of the enablers, half of the capabilities to deter against Russia, half. Europe doesn't even do half of the job at the moment. And it would take a decade for it to even reach half, but that would be a positive way we could work on that together. That would address the burden sharing issues in the United States and it would build more European capability, which many Europeans argue they should do. The second element is Europe should be the first responder to crises on the southern periphery uh, of Europe, in which maybe US or NATO is not their first priority. They'll still be there, but um, Europe should have the ability to be the first responder to deal with those issues. That would also alleviate a bit of the US pressure without diminishing the US um, uh, commitment. And my last point would just be on the politics of this. There is concern here, uh, I think, uh, that our domestic debate is turning in a way that might not sustain the U.S. commitment. Uh, there was, uh, there, just to put in perspective, though, the U.S., I think, security assistance right now over this year to Ukraine has been about $65 billion. That's the equivalent of the Russia, Russia's entire defense budget. Uh, yeah, whereas European contributions are far less, uh, and there is growing concern in the United States that this is not a fair uh, arrangement. Uh, why the Europeans, who are right here, are unable to muster with you know, many, many countries, the same that one country is doing, is not a logic that members of Congress are necessarily going to understand. 
And you can see some comments from some Republican uh, members of the House of Representatives basically pointing in that direction. If the Europeans don't step up, we'll step back. Uh, and Ukraine loses. Yeah. Uh, but that is a clear message. And with the prospect of Republicans capturing maybe one house of the of the Congress in a few weeks, uh, that's something to take seriously. Right. So we have to we have to work on that. So let me stop there. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I, I hate to sort of uh, step in and, 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 and stop you because it was so interesting. Just a very short clarification question. The 65 billion that you mentioned, is that um, uh, military uh, equipment um, or uh, is it it's, the it's overall the, it's, aid, the, um, um, it's just I was just talking about security assistance. That's so, just the security assistance. Then there is the other uh, economic assistance, uh, which is being done in which uh, I believe the U.S. is 8 billion, and I think the EU right. now is about maybe up to 6. Okay, I, I, um, I, I would need so. to, to double check the numbers um, uh, on uh, from, from Kiel Institute. Obviously, the, um, yeah. the German contribution on the military front um, is disappointing, and we discussed that um, uh, with with the German defense minister also, um, but uh, but there is uh, quite a bit on the financial and on the humanitarian side, and that is also quite relevant in the in the current crisis. But let's let's go back to that in a minute. Um, and um, and uh, Angela, uh, I I hope you can cheer us up a bit after this quite depressing <laughs> opening by Daniel, because after all, it's a morning briefing, and we don't want to be depressed all day long. But perhaps we have to be. Uh, to really get the action done. So tell us. Well, I probably will continue to depress you. Um, <laughs> I was actually asked to talk about um, the Chinese-Russian relationship and the U.S. view of China and Russia vis-a-vis -vis this conflict. Maybe the good piece of news to come back to what uh, Dan was saying is one of the things that I think Putin uh, misunderstood or didn't reckon with is we really do have a collective West now. We have North America, Europe, and then we have Japan. We have Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Singapore. We are the collective West. We are united uh, in both condemning what's happened in sanctioning Russia. And so far, I think this is holding together quite well. And I agree with Dan that in the future, I think the, the links between NATO and uh, the Asian partners well, will grow stronger. They were there. Um, at the summit. So this is one of the many things that Putin, I think, miscalculated uh, when he launched this war. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about the miscalculations now. I'm going to talk about Russia and China. Um, and I think Putin wouldn't have launched this war if he wouldn't have believed that China would have supported Russia. And he, since 2014, since China, in a way, rescued Russia after the annexation of Crimea when the West tried to isolate it, China has been really the bedrock enabling Russia to do many of the things that it has done since then. So, of course, <clears throat> on February the 4th, uh, Putin and Xi uh, met in Beijing before the Olympics began. They signed their No Limits Partnership. But I think that we're beginning to see that there are limits. So maybe that's a good piece of news. Um, prior to February 24, I think China saw Russia <clears throat> as a stable, reliable junior partner. Um, and uh, the two were working together to sort of upend what they view as a US dominated world order that doesn't take their interests into account. So this kind of the post West order uh, was one of the, the mantras there. But by the fall of 2022, where we are now, um, Russia is definitely a diminished great power after the massive um, failures on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, and then um, the very botched mobilization effort of Russian soldiers. I mean, yes, they were able to mobilize maybe uh, 200,000 of them, but twice that many have already left, have fled to other countries because they don't want to be mobilized. And I believe that Putin's hold on power is weaker than it was before, um, even though, you know, he still uh, is in power in the Kremlin. He doesn't have, I think, the same hold on power as he did before. Um, and I think those are all things that really are giving the Chinese um, uh, second thoughts about this partnership with Russia. 
Um, so China supports the Russian narrative in this war. The Chinese repeat the, you know, the fact that Russia had to do this special military operation because NATO was threatening Russia. And the Chinese have repeated the propaganda about United States bio labs in Ukraine, you know, uh, manufacturing weapons of mass destruction that could be used against Russia. So rhetorically, that hasn't changed very much. <clears throat> Although occasionally the Chinese do say that they support the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all countries in the world without uh, mentioning other ones. But the Chinese have done very little to help Russia, and maybe that is a good piece of news. Uh, they have, as far as we can see, they have not supplied weapons to Russia. They have been warned repeatedly by the US and by our allies not to do that. Otherwise, they will face severe sanctions. Um, and they are being very careful not to violate the Western sanctions because China's economic interests in relations with the US and with Europe and with our Asian allies are far greater than are their economic interests in relations with Russia. Uh, where we're talking about a rather limited uh, trade volume and uh, no, not much Chinese investment either. Um, so um, in that, and we can see China, for instance, Huawei um, has moved some of its staff from Russia to Central Asia. They're being very, very careful also in the high-tech area not to violate sanctions because they do not want to be the subject of secondary sanctions. And then if you look at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in Uzbekistan uh, last month, you have Putin preemptively saying, well, of course, the Chinese don't, you know, they have some concerns about what we're doing um, in Ukraine. <clears throat> Xi Jinping never mentioned Ukraine either at that summit or at the, at the 20th Party Congress that's just been held. It's a subject that he didn't even want to, want to touch. But having said all of that, um, and I think the Chinese are fairly appalled by what they see happening on the battlefield, mm -hmm. by the way the Russian military has performed. I think they also, like the US, like Europe, thought that the Russian military was a little bit um, <laughs> more effective than it has been. Um, but I think we have to recognize that from Xi Jinping's point of view, they do not want Putin to lose power and they do not want Russia to lose this war, whatever that means, because the nightmare for them would be to have a post Putin government in Russia, difficult as it is to imagine this, that would reassess its relationship with uh, the United States might think about uh, distancing itself from China. Again, it seems very unlikely now, but from the Chinese point of view, this is would really be um, their nightmare. Um, <clears throat> And I think the, but the other thing I think to point out is that the Chinese are becoming increasingly aware of the fact that yes, they and the Russians believe in a post-West order, but for China, this would be a rules-based order. It would still have rules, uh, but the Chinese would have much more of a say in setting these rules. For Russia, and Dan has already alluded to this, this would be a totally disruptive world order. The Russians aren't interested in rules. They're, they, they're disruptive, they um, are spoilers, and that's the kind of post-West order they want, and that's certainly not what the Chinese want. Um, and the final point I'll say on this is just that <clears throat> if you look at what's happening in Central Asia, that this war with Ukraine um, has meant that Russia's ability to influence the post-Soviet space is definitely diminishing. Most of its neighbors are looking askance at what it's done. Kazakhstan has really been distancing itself from Russia in a number of ways, and China is the winner here. Um, you see China increasing its influence and its footprint, if you like, in Central Asia. Now, how does the U.S. view all of this? Um, <clears throat> you may remember that at the very beginning of the Biden administration, it came into office saying it wanted a stable, predictable relationship with Russia, <clears throat> and it really wanted to see if it could persuade Russia to distance itself from China. Well, we know what happened to the stable, predictable relationship, <clears throat> and so far we don't see Russia distancing itself from China. So if you look at the new national security strategy, yes, China is the major threat to the US as described there, but Russia is right behind China. And the combination of Russia and China is now viewed as a particular challenge uh, to US national security interests. Um, and um, I think the US will continue 
so far to try and dissuade China from doing any more to support Russia. Interestingly enough, before the war broke out, the US shared with China information about the Russian mobilization. And, and the Chinese apparently didn't want to believe it, or maybe they weren't the only country, uh, but they didn't apparently take it that seriously. Uh, and so that I think those communications are going on. Um, which, other, which other country wasn't believing it? Can you, can you be more explicit in this? One? I think there were a number of countries in this part of the world who were a little bit more skeptical about it. Can I say that? Um, and But finally, and I'll just end there, you know, from a logical point of view, it would make sense uh, for the United States, given this Chinese-Russian relationship, which is, I think, maybe slightly less... Uh, more tenuous than it was before, although it's still very important, would be to try and actually work with China to try and, and contain Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far, of course, that is not part of the national security strategy, and that's not how the White House sees it. So stop there. <laughs> Wonderful, Angela. And actually, you did cheer me up, to, to be quite honest, because, uh, because uh, I mean, basically, um, what, what I take away is that, that you know, China really um, plays a quite nuanced game here. I mean, it's, it's really not fully in the camp of, of Putin. And uh, I think you, you, show, you talked about the weapon deliveries and many other and the sanctions. You can also talk about, um, you know, substitution of, um, of uh, imports, um, right? I mean, Russia lost a lot of capacity to import mm -hmm. from the West, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't replaced by China. I mean, Chinese exports to Russia also fell, right? So, so there's really... Uh, quite a bit, quite a bit going on on the economic front, and and of course, um, I mean, I would love to trigger a debate between the two of you, basically uh, asking whether you don't co contradict each other, right? Because because no. then yeah. then yeah. you were saying you were basically yeah. saying. Um, how did you phrase it? Um, you know, how will it not only how will it continue, but how will how far will it extend? Um, while you were saying, well, China, yeah, China doesn't want Putin to lose power, but China also doesn't really want um, to to be in a full blown um, full blown um, confrontation with the West. So so there there is some hope perhaps that ultimately there will be a space where where things can be stabilized and and perhaps I can trigger a debate between the two of you after we hear from our own Stefan Meister. Okay, just uh, because I, I think I the idea was to bring a little bit also the German and the European perspective. I just want to start because this is also morning briefing and you both already mentioned this, but I think it's really important what, what's happening at the moment in the occupied territories because it is about us also. I, I think this, this martial law, uh, in the occupied territories and mobilizing Ukrainians against Ukrainians um, to stop also this, this uh, Ukrainian offensive, um, I think is one side. The other side is also what you mentioned um, that um, uh, Russia is, uh, was buying uh, Iranian drones um, and we have also Iranian National Guards who are operating um, or supporting Russia and operating drones uh, from Crimea and also from Belarus. So we have, uh, yeah, we have uh, um, Iranian National Guards at the moment um, in Europe uh, operating drones uh, on, on the ground of, of Ukraine. But I think the main idea here is not only um, uh, the, to, to break uh, the, the motivation of the Ukrainians, but also also to push refugees uh, in, in the winter to Europe. Um, and uh, this is, I think this is really about our resilience. This is really about that, um, that Europe uh, is, is uh, somehow um, pushing the Ukrainians for compromise because there's another big wave of, uh, of refugees coming in. And we see also this hybrid war, what also Dan mentioned on infrastructure, attacks on infrastructure, um, uh, uh, not only not just to talk about uh, disinformation, but also with refugees, um, really to, to, to put us under pressure to support Ukraine uh, less or not, not anymore in that way. And I think that's very important um, to talk about this and also to resist to this, because I think we, we, we now also understand how much Russia is under pressure, is losing also ground, um, and that, that it is really important um, uh, to, to, to survive this winter and to further support Ukraine. I just wanted to make this in the, in the beginning, because I think it's also for the morning preview, I think it's important to, to understand this cynicism also of the Russian, of the Russian um, uh, policy. So I just 
two very quick quick here um uh, just reflecting again on the german and the uh, and the european perspective so i think what we what we what we finally recognized with this war is uh, the end of the post cold war european security order um uh, and that that russia is not a partner but it is an opponent of the eu and and its member states and i think um we finally recognized this um, and also we recognize that our comfort zone uh, is, is ending now. I think we, we try at least to, to, to recognize this. And there will be no cheap gas anymore in, um, in Europe. I think that's over. But I think we, we, we should also understand that Russian elites are on war, on a hybrid war with us since more than eight years. Yeah, so I think, uh, and, and, uh, and also the whole, the whole um, radicalization, securitization of the Russian system, I think was already going on in the last eight years. I think that's very important also to, 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 to understand. And I think uh, several assumptions also of the German uh, politic, um, uh, Ostpolitik, I think, they are really questioned here. Yeah, there is no security outside of NATO anymore. There is no security with Russia possible and at, at the moment only against Russia. Uh, and I think that's really a challenge also for the for the German for the German discourse. And I think we also have to understand we had a conference yesterday also with Dan and, and Angela uh, also discussing with Ru a Russian colleague. Um, the change will the possible change in Russia will only come if Putin loses this war. Uh, because that need that will put him internally under pressure, um, and and that can also only lead to an internal regime change. Uh, it can also um, shift to to maybe a more 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 aggressive or a, a similar regime. But I think uh, to to there the hope that we can negotiate something uh, with Putin on one point. I think it's just not there anymore and i think it needs uh, it needs a change in russia itself to 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 get also um a, a security back um uh, to europe or to start a new process with a different russia yeah with a changing russia and i think this war is changing russia dramatically it's not only bringing violence into the russian society i don't talk here about the ukrainians yeah i think it's also what it is doing with the ukrainian society with the ukrainian state it's really terrible but I think if we're looking into Russia, uh, Russia is becoming a totalitarian state, um, uh, uh, yeah, with uh, with no opposition, with no free media, with repression against any opposition or any um, alternative opinion. And I think that that is changing Russia also for long term dramatically and has an impact also on the relations um, uh, uh, with Russia. Um, uh, two more minutes. Okay. I. Uh, um, I um, I think uh, Zeitenwende speech of Put uh, of of Putin of Scholz was 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 very important for me. Uh, the, the one part was uh, that this is about um, uh, uh, our security also, but the second part was about Trump. It was about that that if there is something coming back like like Trump, um, we are not sovereign in terms of our own security, and we should have already invested much earlier into this, um, and and we have to start at least now. Yeah. So I think this is also about a transatlantic relationship, and um, and and uh, not being sure. Uh, what comes after President Biden and if the if the if the US will stay in Europe? I think th th there is this kind of um, uh, re reborn of the West. I think with this uh, with this um, um, uh, with this war uh, of Russia against Ukraine, but I think uh, we are also in a different world. Yeah, in in a different environment um, uh, uh, where. Um, uh, where the, uh, yeah also your you, domestic policy is, is playing into it and and um, and I think uh, we need to really to think about security um, in a very different way um, and and I think um, I'm not so sure if if we really realized that this comfort zone has ended I, I still have the impression that many people hope we can return to something mm -hmm. similar what was before but I think that's not the case anymore and that's why I think it's 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 not only important to keep the US in Europe and and to to strengthen the European wing of NATO it's also important uh, to 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 be able to act mm -hmm. Also, as Europeans, yeah, in in, uh, in not only with sanctions, but also in terms of uh, of, of a military. But that will take time. 
um, that will take much more investment than 100 billion uh, euro. That will take more investment than two percentage of, um, of, of our GDP. Um, and I think that's a, that's a longer term investment. And I think that, that, that should be done in a European way. So strengthening the European wing of, of NATO, but it should also keep um, uh, the, the transatlantic relations and investing also in, 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 in these transatlantic relations. So I think I stop here. <laughs> One, wonderful, Stefan. Thank you so much for bringing in this, this German perspective. And I think also clearly uh, uh, showing and, and reflecting to our, our American guests today that um, there is a very strong and active debate on these issues, of course, uh, in Germany, also, of course, at the German Council on Foreign Relations. And, you know, we are certainly among those that um, try to highlight the urgency of the situation and the uh, the necessity to step up and really change the mindset. And I really want to sort of rephrase that, uh, re-emphasize that point. Um, the European security order can only be a security order against Russia, not, not with, with Russia, which is really an important statement to make and which not everybody has understood, um, I believe, in, in Germany. And, and I guess the other thing I, I do want to mention, uh, Stefan, uh, and uh, uh, and basically do some advertisement for you because you have a wonderful uh, paper upcoming on exactly all the uh, mistakes in our thinking um, uh, over the last uh, decades, um, but also even now on on the Ostpolitik and you know how how it should be reformed and um, you know um, what are what what could be a new strategy. So 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 watch out that that paper is going to to be published soon. Um, and I think it's really a worthwhile read. Um, so um, before we go to some of the questions, I do want to give uh, Dan and, and Angela a chance to, to perhaps interact on, on that one point, which was the sort of, uh, which I raised, which is really about, I mean, you said it will proliferate further or it will extend further. At the same time, there may be limits um, uh, of what China really wants to do. So, so so how, what are the limits ultimately? I mean, when I heard you, uh, Daniel, I was thinking, okay, what he's basically telling us is that we are uh, fast moving forward to, to World War III, right? Um, uh, perhaps I mis mis misheard you, but, uh, but please, um, perhaps you can react a bit to, to that point. Um, and, and, then, and then you, Angelo, of course. No, I hope, uh, hope uh, what I was talking about is how we avoid that. Uh, but I think we should be realistic that, how should I frame this quickly? If you, especially sitting here, uh, and I lived here when the wall was here and when it came down, uh, in 1989, we focused on the unifying force of German unity and European unity. Europe was coming together. And that tended to be our frame of mind as the earth shaking revolution from 1989 and 1991, if you want to put it that way. But I think we have to think maybe a little harder that there perhaps were two other revolutionary developments at the same time, which are still shaking us. One is that the Chinese leaders in 1989 had a very different approach to those changes. Tiananmen was also 1989. They decided, you know, no chaos, uh, and they clamped down. And since then, they think they've been right. Uh, and they, the worst thing for them in their mind was a kind of a Gorbachev type of uh, Soviet Union imploding into this chaos all across Eurasia. That was gonna be the last thing China wanted. And, you know, I believe Chinese leaders think, you know, they're the ones that got this right. And that's the other development that we're now dealing with. But the third one, and I'll just, just provoke here, is the Soviet succession, in my mind, is not over. So 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, but what is to become of that space is still up in the air. And includes not only Russia's relations with all of its neighbors, in this imperialist tradition that still has strong support in Russia. It is in my mind about the nature, and in fact, even the borders of the Russian Federation itself. Uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, can be very worrying uh, to many of us if we think about it, 
But on the other hand, and even a democratic Russia, I believe, uh, might even go in that direction. It's hard to know how democratic leaders in Russia would be able to control a lot of, you know, centrifugal kind of forces across that space. And China, you know, would be totally scared by all of that. So, uh, and you see some of the Belt and Road, much of the Belt and Road is to try to yeah. go around Russia, uh, not to include it. So I think we, that's my point. We have to be prepared for this type of situation in which it's not only great power competition with each of the powers posing a different challenge to us, it's embedded in a set of disruptive, unsettled uh, trends that are gonna upend our basic principles that we had constructed for 30 years. We have to really be prepared for that. And um, so it's not, you know, if we're not prepared for that, I think there will be some more conflicts that we are not gonna be able to anticipate. So it's a different mindset. That's my, basically my, mm -hmm. my point. So when Vladimir Putin talks about Russian exceptionalism, he really believes that the Rus that Russia is the exception to the global rule that all empires in the end end. And so he hasn't accepted the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed. He's questioned whether that was legitimate or not. Um, and what he's trying to do, and he's been explicit about it, is to essentially restore the Russian empire as he sees it. Um, what he wanted at the beginning of this conflict was to, you know, subjugate Ukraine, have a pro-Russian government in Ukraine, and then create a new Slavic state of Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, maybe northern Kazakhstan. Uh, and that, I think, is still his ambition. But of course, it doesn't look as if he's going to do that anytime soon. Um, but I think we should be quite clear that as long as he or people who have the same mindset as he does are in power, that will remain their aim um, to regard what happened in 1991 as a travesty, uh, you know, a plot by different intelligence agencies in the West, whatever, and to restore what was before. Uh, now, to, to go back to the Chinese angle here. So I do not think that the Chinese um, would look very favorably on, you know, a much more expansionist war. And I think one of the things that should deter Putin, and we haven't really discuss this in terms of the possible use of a tactical nuclear weapon would be if Russia breaks, you know, the 77 year old taboo um, mm. on the use of nuclear weapons. I think that's something that the Chinese would really look at at. Because again, as a nuclear power, they believe that there are certain rules that shouldn't be broken. And so I think that could be a constraint on Putin, although I, I can't tell you it will be. <laughs> um. Right, so, so let me give the word to, to, to Stefan, but then I, I will take questions. I'm not sure if I have a microphone for, for questions in the room, um, but please uh, online, if you want to ask questions, ideally put them in the chat. I'm not sure whether we can hear you. We might, we might be able to, we will hear you also from, uh, from the screen. So just raise your hand and then I'll see you popping up here and, and give you the floor. Um, but Stefan, please. Only two quick points. Just to clarify this, uh, my my main point was uh, there's no security with Russia at the moment, but against Russia, only against Russia. At the same time, I think if we if we create a new European security order, yeah, which has has to be created, uh, on one point we have to integrate also Russia. Um, I think we cannot think uh, in long term European security without Russia. Um, and but for this, Russia has to change itself. I think that's the big challenge. Yeah, but I think we also have to think in terms. So we do a lot of crisis management at the moment, but I think we need to think also in long term about a different Russia and how to um, how to support also this process of uh, of uh, of creating uh, or helping to create a different Russia. That was the first point. The second point, um, also as a reaction, what Dan has said. Um, I think it's really crucial to understand that the end of the Russian Soviet Empire was not 1991, but it is now. It's now ending, um, and Putin is accelerating the, 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 the disintegration of, of the empire with this war, um, and he's pushing away um, even further um, the other post-Soviet countries. The result will be um, uh, new regional orders in Central Asia, 
in the South Caucasus uh, Black Sea region in in Eastern Europe, and uh, and we will we see already third powers coming in. Uh, in Central Asia, this is mainly China. Um, in the South Caucasus, it's Turkey. Um, and the question is: Is the EU? Uh, um, is the West uh, also a, a player here to shape um, to shape these orders? And I think uh, candidate status for Ukraine, for instance, Moldova, and and partly for for um, uh, for Georgia, I think is is a part of also shaping this 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 order. But I think we will see an increasing competition among different powers um, about these different spaces and and shaping these different orders. And we will have we will see more and more instability. Russia was creating a kind of authoritarian stability in this region, but Russia is now is weakening itself with this war. It is not attractive anymore. It has no soft power, um, and it's even losing its military power with this war. Um, that means other powers will use this opportunity. And that's something for us also very important um, in terms of the ability to act, uh, because this is also about our neighborhood. Yeah, and I think uh, that's why I think we also have to have an interest um, uh, in terms of stability, prosperity, development to shape um, the, these neighborhoods and and uh, and um, and manage also this disintegration of, um, of the empire. That was the, just the point I wanted to make. Thank you. A, a really important point. Putin is accelerating the demise of, of the Soviet empire um, because he's forcing and trying to restore old glory. He actually uh, accelerates um, accelerates the demise. And I think this is a very, very important point that you also made in a, in a great commentary recently. Um, let me take a few questions and perhaps we start with the colleague here in the audience. Short questions so that we have a chance to discuss, please. Thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have a question to Stefan and to Angela. There were actually two questions. One is the disintegration of the empire that you talked about. You talked about the external. What about internally in Russia and its destruction? The other question is Mr. Schultz is going to see Xi, Xi Jinping. What is he doing there? What is Germany's role? What does what you expect? And Angela, please, what do you expect the Chinese to, to do? Right. Uh, let's let's collect uh, because these are great questions. I have an answer to that one as well to to uh, to Scholz. So I can I can I can say something on Scholz's trip. But but let's uh, let's have one more question here. From, yeah. Yeah. Please. So and um, and if you could identify yourself. Um, sorry. That's that's yeah. always. I'm I'm J D Bindenagel. I was the ambassador. I'm now professor at Bonn University and now. Oh, at Bonn. Okay. Right. So my name is Karl Hufnagel. I'm just a member of DGAP. So um, my question is, um, the Chinese help or lack of it for Russia. You said China doesn't want Russia to lose. What happens if they see Russia would be losing without their help? What are their options? For example, could they uh, deliver trucks? Could they deliver drones? Or would they shy away from it? What would they do? Yeah. And let's take one more question online here from uh, a journalist from Tokyo to Professor Angela Stent. Um, how do you think Russia's invasion of Ukraine will affect China's attitude towards Taiwan? <laughs> All right. So, so I think this is a rich set of questions. Please. Um, Okay, so I think um, that's a great question. You know, what will the Chinese do if it looks if Russia is losing? I mean, so far, oops. Oh, it's okay. uh, so far, I think the calculation is that, you know, given their own economic interests, that they don't want to um, be the subject of secondary sanctions. And that, I think, would r restrain them from supporting Russia. So I don't see that calculus changing. Um, I'd be surprised if it did. Um, I will think I will allow uh, uh, your question about what Mr. Schultz is going to do in China. Maybe Gundram will, will talk about that. Um, China, Taiwan. So um, I think the lesson that the Chinese, I mean, there are several lessons. One of them is that if they did uh, decide to reunify with Taiwan, there would be very extensive sanctions against them um, if they look at what's happened uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, they must also think about the fact if they look at the way the Ukrainians have fought back um, and how this is really how high their morale is, they might think about uh, would there be a similar 
situation in Taiwan where the, you know, being being attacked by China would really um, inspire people to, to fight back quite heroically. So in some ways you could say this should act as a deterrent. Um, but on the other hand, you know, in the longer run, I, I, my understanding is this isn't something that's on the cards at the moment. We've just had this mm -hmm. party Congress. Xi Jinping is consolidating his rule. So this is not something I think that would be imminent anyway. On the disintegration of Russia itself, um, I don't I don't think that this is at the moment really taking place because I think we we have really a huge amount of security forces. We have the National Guard who is, is still working quite well. Russia is not running out of money for the next, let's say, two years. Uh, it, it still can pay also its its um, its security people. We can see the same in Belarus. I think Lukashenko is just transferring all the money he has left over to 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 the to the to the security forces to keep them loyal to the system. But if we think in middle middle term, um, I think. Uh, we have to understand Russia is becoming weaker in in any way in in terms of technology, in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, economic development. Sanctions will bite more and more the longer they are they are they are active. Um, that that means Russia will become poorer. Um, uh, it will run out of money on one point because its business model is not working anymore with selling gas to Europe, um, and it's not so easy uh, you, or quick. You can build up alternatives uh, to, to to Asia, for instance, um, uh, and um, and I think then it's really about um, if if they lose this war, yeah. So and I think that can also create um, a, a, a situation um, of disintegration or of of that the the the, the, the security elites on one point is side they have to replace Putin because he's he's a it's rather a problem than a solution to anything also from their perspective yeah so um uh, I so I don't think in short term disintegration but I I can imagine in in middle term in long term if this policy is going on mm -hmm. um it can also happen that we have a disintegration of of, um, of Russia um, I, I'm curious uh, to hear also uh, Gundram uh, talking about Scholz uh, in, in um, uh, uh, meeting Xi Jinping. I only say one sentence or two, two sentences. So I think I think that needs to be decided still. Uh, that would be would be my argument. I think there are still uh, German economy has a huge interest, uh, uh, and I think uh, China is is for many companies about 30, 40, or 50, 60 percent. It's not like Russia three or four percent. Yeah, I think that's really uh, for the for the German economy existential, um, uh, and I think we we on we always argue um, uh, we have to learn from Russia how to deal with China. Yeah, also in a way, but Russia is also not China. I think we cannot completely diversify away from China. Um, uh, we we will need we will need to be less dependent on China, but I think it's impossible for the for at the moment to 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 work without the Chinese market and also the supply of of technology and so on from China. So I think um, uh, I, I can imagine that Scholz is trying a middle way, yeah, to uh, to to uh, to uh, on one hand uh, we still want to do business, on the other hand we are more, more careful with, with with China, yeah, at, um, uh, and getting more careful. Right. Um, well, I, I, I guess uh, <clears throat> I'm quite close to, to where you are. Uh, I would disagree on your point that China is existential for the German economy. It's existential for big companies, uh, some of the German big companies, but it's not existential for the German economy. And, and I think there's pretty, pretty good studies showing that, actually. But the big companies, they matter, of course. So in that sense, it's existential. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what what Scholz Scholz will say um, and want to say, but it seems to me he has to really pass on three three big messages. I mean, the first is, it seems to me very much in line uh, of what you said, Angela, is the resolve of the West um, on the sanctions, right? I mean, uh, we need to pass a clear message that if China was um, uh, starting to supply uh, weapons and, you know, become really involved in supporting uh, Russia, sanctions would would uh, be extended um, to, uh, to China. And I think that's the first message it seems to me has to pass. Um, the second big message is um, that any trade and investment uh, discussion with China uh, is uh, a European discussion and Europe will remain united on these issues, right? And we will not accept um, 
to uh, uh, sort of um, have economic coercion against some countries of the EU, such as Lithuania, but really act, act united. And I guess the third um, is on, Stefan, on your point, um, I don't think uh, the strategy uh, can be to decouple. That doesn't make sense. Um, on so many dimensions, it doesn't make sense. But of course, we have to focus on concentrated risks, right? And there are a couple of areas where, be that solar panels, be that rare earths, be that um, specific materials, uh, where risks are extremely concentrated. And also in the corporate, the big companies, some of the big companies have very concentrated risks, balance sheet exposures, because they make so many, so much profit in, in China, actually. And so, so those I mean, the profit making is fine, but please set up your company operation in a way that if you lose those profits, you survive, right? Um, so, so that's a very corporate uh, corporate um, approach to uh, the, where, where the corporate sector really has to act. And uh, we are actually coming out with a paper on, on these issues also, um, I think, next week or so. so. Um, all right, so let me take some more uh, uh, questions or uh, some more questions and then give the floor to you, Dan, uh, th that we have a chance. Um, the, the Japanese question on, on, on Taiwan, uh, I think, was already answered, but let me just add one. I don't know if online there's still another question, but let me add from... Okay, so, so but um, g let me just read from the chat and then from the room. So... So one, one person in the chat highlights, I want to add that China has recently been the world's fifth leading arm exporter and the world's top exporter of military drones, but none of their no-limits partners in much of the Middle East, uh, while Russia had to turn to Iran and North Korea, not to China. And then there's another question um, that was more of a comment. Uh, another question for, for Daniel. Does Daniel Hamilton think there are any strategic circumstances in which the U.S. West should encourage Ukraine to negotiate with Russia, or should the U.S. West only accept complete Russian withdrawal from all Ukrainian territories, uh, reparations to Ukraine, Putin's demise, and humiliation of Russia? So um, that's, uh, that's a spicy one. And then uh, Gerhard Wittmann is asking um, uh, a question to our American guests. What is the position of the Republican Party in the U.S. towards the strong support of the U.S. to Ukraine? From my point of view, the party seems to be divided on this issue. Um, and I just want to make sure that I don't miss any question. Um, but I think these were the questions from the audience. And so one more question here from the room, and then we have the final round, and then you get a a few more minutes so that you can capture all these big questions to you, please. Uh, hi, I'm Anastasia Pochumban. I'm a research fellow at the GAP. I have a question, perhaps to, but perhaps all of you. Uh, I'd like to ask you, how do we continue uh, to maintain the support for Ukraine, but also on a global level, taking into consideration, for instance, the position of India and the existing Russian, but also Chinese influence in the African countries and in Southeast Asia. And I think we could see it with the recent UN resolutions and the countries that abstained for voting from voting. Uh, and the narratives that exist about food export and grains and the sanctions. So how do we continue engagement considering what you said and that the war is going on? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this great question. And I think now we have enough questions for another one hour, but we only have six minutes left. So then perhaps we start with you and take uh, take a bit of time to answer. Okay. Uh, on Ukraine, uh, U.S., I think the standard U.S. comment on that is it's up to the Ukrainians, not up to us. Uh, we can't possibly just determine for a country that's been under such brutal attack how they should resolve this with Russia. It's not for us, it's for them. And if they want to uh, continue, uh, they have every right to do so. Uh, I don't believe any Ukrainian president negotiates something uh, with Russia right now that leaves Russian forces uh, on Ukrainian territory would be Ukrainian president for more than one day. Uh, and so I don't think that's my point. This is going to continue. Uh, how it will continue and what shapes and forms is hard to know, but we have to be prepared that it, we're talking about persistent confrontation with Russia, 
not only in Ukraine, but across the entire space that we've been talking about for as far as the eye can see, we are in a simply different space now. And that's what we have to think about. And the Ukrainian conflict, the, con the war on Ukraine is part of that, but it's, it's about a much bigger uh, issue, which of course, Putin is counting on outlasting us. Uh, he believes he can, he can do that. Uh, and he's mobilizing all of his resources, as Stefan indicated, martial law, all this to, to continue these tactics. Uh, so our, the question we have to face is, can we sustain this ourselves? And I think that's the question, again, about the Republicans on our side. Um, I think the question was right. I think both parties, frankly, are they always are debating everything, but both parties have... Uh, the Republicans more than Democrats at the moment, kind of a civil war going on within their own party about, you know, the soul of the Republican Party, not only with regard to Ukraine, but just basically. Uh, and so which Republicans win uh, is really, really does matter. It's not just Republicans. So I think one has to be a bit more nuanced in, in our, our debate. Uh, I think the administration is considering that if... Um, Kevin McCarthy's comments, he might be the next Speaker of the House, are correct that Republicans are not going to give Ukraine what he calls a blank check uh, if the U.S. heads into recession. Um, there are some ways to preempt that a little bit, at least for some time. Um, there's, uh, if the Republicans get a, a control of one House of the Congress in November, there's still a lame duck session of the Congress in which the Democratic majority still hold in December. And they have to pass some really important bills like the National Defense Authorization Act. And one can put more assistance into Ukraine for Ukraine into that. So there are options to continue U.S. assistance uh, beyond this term um, going forward. But I think, again, my message to my European friends here is uh, much, much of the U.S. debate depends more on Europe than maybe you understand and can be influenced more than maybe you believe. Because if you listen to their rationale for maybe stepping back, it is that Europe has not stepped up. So if Europe would step up more on some of the security assistance front, uh, that might change some of the debate. Uh, so that's the one point. I think the broader point about NATO too, in terms of 2% now is basically considered the floor. It's not no longer the target, it's the floor. Uh, and we have to do much more than that. And there are, you know, people are watching very carefully and particularly what Germany's doing in terms of adjusting to its new role in NATO. Uh, so if, if the Europeans would embrace this idea that let's do burden sharing in a strategic way with some real clear goals, I gave you two, for a decade, I think that influences the US debate. More Doing more in Europe helps the US do more in Europe. It's not, it's not a reason not to do anything, which often I hear. Mm -hmm. So um, my, if I could just, if I can just intrude on this interesting German debate on China, um, uh, I do think <clears throat> China is existential for Germany, but not in the way that I heard just described. It is because it's building uh, competitive industries, industries that are directly competitive with the German model. That's why it's existential. It's becoming a co concrete, direct competitor in a way that challenges the fundamental German model itself. And Germany is helping it do that. That's why it's existential. But that, mean, that means something different. It means you have to, uh, again, rethink the German model. And that's part of this whole strategic uh, re recasting. Uh, you know, my, our friend Constanze Schelson Miller says, you know, Germany outsources security to the United States, its energy to Russia, and its economic model to China. <clears throat> and all three have to be rethought. So, uh, and what's happened is that Germany's become more dependent on the United States in security, not less now. So this is why it's even more important to, to shift in a new way with us, not in an autonomous way that I, I don't even understand what that term means. Uh, energy, uh, Germany is making a massive effort to shift from that energy dependence. But if we think about it, shifting, it's becoming uh, 
uh, to a green transition with us, hopefully, the United States, you're, in essence, shifting your dependency on Russia for dependency on China. Because the critical raw materials, the things that will power the green revolution are in China, or they're in other unreliable, un, let's how we say, un, unstable sources. So we have to rethink that. Hopefully we could do it together because the transatlantic energy economy now has become the new dynamic here that didn't even exist a few years ago. And, and the last point about China is uh, I think the U.S. and Europe are coming together on how we're assessing uh, China. Uh, the national security strategy basically goes in the direction of what the European Union had been saying, uh, but they just prioritize it differently, right? It is a systemic rival. It's also a competitor. But interestingly, the Biden administration said on some issues, we're ready to work with them. Uh, and that is essentially what the EU has been saying too, except the other order. They've been saying it's a partner first, then a competitor, then systemic but rivalry. But are converging on that. I think You're the, that's what I, I just think said. The, I think the systemic rivalry certainly becomes more important. But uh, Schultz's story, so. mission that's questions what, all of that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's and Mr. Macron, I think, is getting on the next plane uh, yeah. in, okay. in that month. A Angela, please. Thank you. Let me just uh, tackle your question about the global south, because I think that's a real challenge. Uh, we talked about China already. India, right? It's a partner of the United States in the Quad. Um, and yet um, it won't, won't condemn Russia. It won't sanction Russia. Um, it's very careful about what it does. Um, and then all of the other BRICS countries, South Africa, Brazil, and then, um, as you mentioned, much of the Middle East, Africa, um, and Latin America, even Mexico, right? The major trade partner of the United States. Uh, they, they, they formed a Russia-Mexico caucus in their legislature after the war had begun. So all of these countries have different reasons for not wanting to, um, uh, you know, to, to condemn Russia or to sanction Russia. Um, and it's, an, it's gonna be an uphill struggle. I mean, I think particularly with a country like India, the US is trying to use all of, of its powers of persuasion to try and get them to rethink this. Uh, but they, you know, the Indians have significant economic interests. Um, they're a major, major arms purchase that have been for decades uh, from Russia, but also now energy, getting all of this cheap Russian energy. And so I, I think what it means is you know, the, the contours, the global contours are shifting, but I think Russia's ability to exert both hard and soft power in the global south, that is going to continue irrespective of what happens uh, in the war. Uh, and again, if you look at uh, Africa, the activities of the Wagner uh, military groups there, the way that they're helping sustain um you know, a number of rulers in power. So I think it's going to be very difficult. What I find so interesting is that um, you know, that much of the global South refuses to see what's happening essentially as a colonial or imperial war. Um, you know, that they, the imperialism, colonialism, that's the United States, it's Britain, it's France, it's, you know, the, the European countries formally. Um, and yet, if you talk to people in Russia's neighborhood, they very much understand this as a kind of an imperial colonial war. But I do not know how you shift this narrative. And I think some of it has to do with the natural tendency of many of the countries in the global south to sort of um, accuse the United States of hypocrisy, to say, you know, what's different about what's happening in Ukraine? Look at, you know, you name the conflict, Vietnam, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and that is, I mean, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah, very, very short, two, two, two points I just want to make. I think China is supporting Russia, so it's not, it's not that they are not doing anything. I think Russia is getting semiconductors from, from China. Uh, we see that trade, for instance, uh, between Russia and Turkey, uh, Russia and India, Russia and China has has grown, yeah, uh, dramatically. So, and this is not only about resources. This is not only about buying more oil and gas, but it is also um, about other products uh, which might uh, circumvent sanctions. So, I think th they are very careful, but but still, there are countries, which, big countries, which supporting Russia uh, despite the war. On your question, um, uh, uh, Anastasia. Um, I had a discussion last week, very, very interesting discussion with uh, with a big group of stakeholders from from the global south, 
uh, from all these countries uh, Angela just mentioned. Um, and um, I, I think what I managed in the end uh, with, with, in the discussion was that they were, were also disagreeing with each other. So I don't think that there is really a block uh, of countries who are against uh, the Western sanctions or supporting Russia. I think they don't like what Russia is doing. They don't like that Russia is undermining um, the global orders, undermining sovereignty of, of a state. Um, but uh, they, they feel also this arrogance of the West that uh, we are doing sanctions now, you have to follow us. Um, they, are, they are feeling this arrogance or, or they're, they're reflecting this also through the colonial pol policy. But if you look, 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 look then deeper also in, in, into uh, their arguments, you can also understand that they are in the end not really supporting Russia. Yeah. Right. So and I think we have to be here less arrogant. Yeah. We have to, 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 to argue with them and, and we have to take <clears> this more seriously. I think that's that's yeah. for me uh, about reacting to, to to the situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And we are way over time. But let me finish by thanking you and uh, also saying that the next week we, we will pause because of the break um, and we will resume on the 3rd of November with a, with a morning briefing again. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Stefan. It was a great discussion. Thank you.